patriarchs and men and women that God used for his glory and honor in the scriptures. And we have looked at several and uh, kind of going through alphabetical uh, names, not necessarily in order, but as we look at them, we're trying to take just a few moments for each individual each morning. And many of those who can take and spend days speaking on them, we're just summarizing uh, their life. And I've entitled this series, The Story of My Life According to the Bible. And uh, so this one is going to the book of Judges and we'll begin in chapter number seven and verse number one, where we just a few verses of scripture. And uh, take just a moment of time for this, or men, I appreciate them coming in for the recording uh, to get the messages and the gospel into the prisons. And, uh, you know, we're living in a dead age where there's a requirement for a great sacrifice on our part as far as our self-ambitions, our goals, our uh, desires, our dreams, our resources uh, to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. And I was just talking to someone uh, yesterday and we were talking about the vaccine and there's such a heated argument over it and so forth of who's going to get it, who's not going to get it, the, and the nanotechnology and all of this. And to be honest with you, um, I've absolutely got to the place I despise having to watch the news. I have to because to keep up with world events and things that are taking place with the ministry since we're established on so many nations. Uh, if I was a someone that was just local, uh, where I didn't do a lot of traveling and wouldn't have some of the responsibilities I have, I probably would make some decisions that are a little bit different than I'm having to make currently because of responsibilities uh, that the Lord has given to us. But I absolutely hate watching the news because of all the sarcasm, the criticism, uh, the attitudes in our government. And be honest with you, uh, it makes me want to have an attitude. And I kind of feel like Dr. Lester Olaf said one time, about Jezebel, he said, you know, he said, I'd like to get hold of her and just squeeze her at the neck until her head pops off her shoulders. And um, he said that in Christian love, quote unquote, you know, if you know anything about uh, Brother Roloff. But um, he was basically, of course, didn't mean that literally, but emphasizing the frustration of some of the things that are taking place at that time in America and around the world, and uh, some of the liberal politicians and politics and today in age, the age we live in, even some of the quote conservative politicians uh, are more liberal than what our moderates used to be uh, some years ago, uh, regardless of the political party. And as we get into the scripture, many of these that we've been looking at lived in days and times and eras where uh, they faced many of the same situations and circumstances we're facing today as far as liberalism and uh, our enemies and so forth. And one of those today that we're going to look at is Gideon. And Gideon uh, certainly faced a great challenge in his lifetime. But God's going to show himself strong and mighty. And I'm persuaded that in our day, in our age, in our time, if we'll just stand strong God will hear and God will answer prayer and God will give great deliverance even as he did in the days of old. Now look with me if you would please in the book of Judges in chapter number seven and we'll begin in verse number one. Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley, and the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. Now therefore I go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And they returned to the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. So we find that verse number 3 reveals that Gideon had 32,000 in its entirety of his army to run and fight against the Midianites. And the Bible very clearly said that they were spread across the valley like grasshoppers in the sand of the seashore, and it was innumerable. But notice in verse number 4, the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Now, I'm not going to really get into this particular battle because we're trying to summarize the life of some of these patriarchs of the scripture, both men and women. But as we consider this matter, notice the odds that are against Gideon. He starts out with 32,000. The Lord says, Gideon, you've got too many. Uh, 22,000 went home. They took a rain check, if you please, on the battle and said, we'll catch you next time. God comes back and says to Gideon, 10,000 is still too many. Because I know Israel, I know their a tendency to brag on themselves and to put out their chest and say, look what I've done. 
You say, I don't see that in the scripture. It's not. It's in the fine print that, you know, is with disappearable ink, unreadable ink. But as I consider the matter, uh, God is telling them that Israel will vaunt themselves. They'll brag of their great mighty uh, power and their prowess of being able to have great military might. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people in verse number four, yet too many, bring them down to the water and I will try Pardon me, I will try them for thee, and it shall be that whom I say unto thee, these, uh, this shall go with thee, and the same shall go with thee, and whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. And so he brought the people, I uh, brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water uh, with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set aside likewise every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to the other uh, mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. I'm going to stop there for the sake of time. Uh, but this morning we find that from Judges chapter number 6 through Judges chapter number 8 reveals the great accomplishments and what God allowed Gideon to accomplish. Isn't it wonderful that we have all these great stories of Gideon and it's crammed into just a few chapters of the Bible. You know, it doesn't take long for God to intercede in a man's life or a woman's life and use them for his glory and honor. You know, I've thought about this. Uh, someone some years ago said this, said, have you ever thought that God may prepare a man, put you through the, all your life experiences just to use you in a great way, in a great fashion for one time? Yes. And you know, it only takes that. God can take an entire lifetime and allow one event, just a moment's notice and a moment's action to be able to impact the world and to make a difference in history and society. His name means fellow according to the scriptures and according to uh, Proverb Briggs and the Hebrew definitions, it means a hewer. Also, we find in the text that his name is found 39 times in the Old Testament and one time in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews in chapter number 11. He is mentioned as many of these that were covered in Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. As we consider the story of Gideon, it uh, begins, God has allowed the Midianites and others to come in and to afflict Israel because of their sin and their transgression. Much like Elijah, when he comes on the scene, Elisha and other prophets that God used, uh, God has used the enemies of Israel to afflict Israel uh, to get their attention because of their sin and transgression. And God raises up these great men of God that uh, many of them, the Bible, as I've often said, reveal some of their weaknesses or struggles and their challenges and even their failures and sin, and God will use them for his glory and for his honor. The Midianites were nomads. They traveled and they would join in with various people and they were uh, they hated Israel, much like uh, the Afghans and many others today, and the Muslims and others uh, that despise Israel. And you mark it down to them. I'm not going to get into the political arena. Uh, not that I'm afraid to, but I don't have the time this morning. But you mark it down. America and the world and Christians worldwide hasn't seen anything yet as what's coming in the near future. Uh, the people of, of God were oppressed. Uh, they had been under affliction because of the Midianites and uh, their enemies. And we find that in Judges chapter 6, they cried unto the Lord and God heard the cries of his people. Then God sends and raises up a man by the name of Gideon in our text. And God's going to use Gideon in a great way. Uh, it would seem that uh, for some reason, and many would uh, say that Gideon had some uh, maybe inferiority complex or was incompetent, I guess is what most commentators say about him. And uh, that may be, I'm not sure, but I believe if the Lord, and of course he didn't order this time, but if God raised me up with the 299 men or 300 men all total, uh, going against a, a valley of Midianites that were innumerable, I suppose I'd want a little confirmation too, amen? Uh, woe be unto the man or the woman who charges headlong into the lion's den without proper prayer and preparation. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Somebody say amen again right there. Amen. Uh, amen. The fool, only the fool, would say in his heart that there's no God and charge headlong against all the forces of hell. And of course, we find that 
uh, he puts out the sheep, uh, you know, and asks for the wool and asks for a fleece and uh, with the dew and so forth. We're all familiar with that. I don't want to take time to delve into it. <clears throat> but we find that God heard and he answered his prayer. And uh, so uh, we find that God's going to deliver Israel. And uh, also we find that they go into the camp of the Midianites uh, the night before battle. And again, he's on that final confirmation. He goes in and God sent uh, 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 dreams uh, amongst the Midianites. It's interpreted and it's stated very clearly that God's going to take the Israelites and uh, God's going to give them great victories and the Midianites are going to be given into their hands. And the people go to bed that night and they've got this on their mind. And all of a sudden, God speaks to Gideon and his 300 soldiers and he tells them to encircle the camp and at the given time, they're to blow the trumpets and they're to break the ve vessels and they've got lights or lamps on the inside and they're to give a whopping shout. And at the clue of Gideon, and they do that, or at the queue of Gideon, uh, they shout, they break the vessels, the light shows forth, and they cry, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Amen. And uh, at that, the Midianites get up, and you know, they don't have, uh, Israel, Gideon, his family, they don't even have to raise a sword at the, in the initial beginning, because the Bible said the Midianites rose, and they thought that Israel was in their camp, and they began to slaughter one another. You know, God has a way of giving the victory even when the odds are against us. Amen. And that's what we learn about Gideon, uh, that God's for us when the odds are against us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. And so as we consider uh, this great miracle that God gave to Gideon, here we have a man that uh, God's going to use in spite of himself. Whether uh, the commentators would be right that he's incompetent or whatever, I would argue against that. But uh, whatever be the case, regardless of the situation, uh, he's going to be used mightily of God. And again, I say, as I've said with every one of these, it doesn't matter what our weaknesses are, what our failures are. And I said to our staff here a while back in some of our training and the advanced leadership, you know, we can't always give you a point one, point two, point three. Have you ever had your kids say to you, why should I do that? And as preachers, we say, well, number one, because, and number two, because, and number three, because. And it's, it's not so bad with the kids, but when you start doing it to your spouse. Yeah. Well, number one, because I said so. Number two, because I said so. Number three, because I said so. It works. <laughs> uh, Brother Jeff will be in with two black eyes tomorrow and a swollen lip at that. He'll surgically have some teeth removed. <laughs> uh, picking on Brother Jeff this morning. But, you know, we, we get that away. Sometimes we just don't have the answers. And I've had over the years, I've had people say, well, Brother Ellis, I, I'll give you this. And I've got to close. My time's already gone already. But someone said to me, it's been several years ago, it was a pastor. And he sat down, he said to me, he said, Brother Ellis, he said, how do you raise kids to serve God? And uh, I said, well, I don't know yet. I said, my kids aren't grown yet. And most importantly, I'm not dead yet. So I can't answer that question. <laughs> All right. So even when they're gone, uh, they can go awry. And especially when they're home in these days, I've known of uh, one pastor's kid, two of them. Uh, they seem like, well, I know several of them, but uh, just in recent months, it uh, seemed like the kids would be able to walk on water. And um, as soon as they turned 18, they went out and turn their back on all their upbringing yeah. upon the Lord and all their biblical training. Yeah. It's a sad tragedy. Another one, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, I don't even get into it, but the pastor has lost his family, lost his kids, and I would have thought if there was any children in America that loved God and was sold out, it would have been them. But all come to find out, it was because when they were home, they were under the control of their parents. I'm not saying we're all not to have control, no misunderstanding. All I'm simply saying is this, is Gideon is one of those that he just wants assurance from God that God's going to do what he says. And the Lord used them in a great and mighty way. If I could just say this this morning, uh, during, this, during the time of Gideon, uh, after the war and after the battle, uh, they tried to make him ruler over them. The Bible very clearly says this in chapter number 8, verse 24 through 27. Uh, they came to him and said, Gideon, we want you to rule over us and thy sons. And you know what Gideon tells them? It'd be easy for, especially in the day and age we live, would have said, sure, I'll be glad to rule over you. Yeah. Uh, what you going to pay? Uh, wh what's the benefits? Um, somebody else, I'll be glad to rule over you if somebody else take all the stress and strain, the heartaches and the sorrows and the heartbreaks and make all the tough decisions. What, what are you going to pay? 
You know what Gideon said? I'm not ruling over you, and my family's not ruling over you. You already have a ruler. The Lord, God's your king. I want nothing to do with it. But he did ask for one thing. He asked for the earrings of his enemy. He took and he melted them down and made ephod and other things. And you know what Israel did later? Israel did what Israel seemed to always do, just like we do today. Israel took what was a symbol of victory and the blessings of God, and they turned it into idolatry and worshiped it. And you know, that's what we do in America. That's what we do in our society. We take the great victories that God gives us, and we almost turn it into an idolatry. We worship the victory. God forbid. Gideon said, I want nothing to do with it. You've already got a king. It's God, Jehovah. Amen. Worship him. Give us a course, but Robert, if you would like to What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Lord bless you. Let's get to our responsibilities.